Hello everyone, so today we're going to be talking about a couple of very interesting things. Uh, it mainly includes the Catlin's conjecture and the Pillai's conjecture. And we're actually going to see how this unsolved problem, which was unsolved back in the day, I should put it like that, and how that actually relates to the question given in the problem, which came in a math Olympiad, a contest style problem. So let's see how that goes. So this is the third problem from the day two of the France DST in the year 2000. So it happens to be the last problem on the team selection test. And in this video, we're going to be looking at Catlin's conjecture and its generalization, which is called the Pillai's conjecture. Now, Pillai's conjecture is not really related to this problem, but I think it's, uh, it's good to little bit discuss a little bit about it. I just like maybe put a line or two about that in there. And after that, we have the Zygmunt-Dee's theorem, of course, which we've discussed a couple of times before. After that, we have some book sessions, the senior math Olympiads, and, and at the end, a similar bit challenging problem. This video is sponsored by Chinta.com. Since 2010, Chinta has trained thousands of students from all around the world in mathematical Olympiads, physics Olympiads, computer science and informatics Olympiads, ISI CMI entrances, and research projects for school and college students. Okay, so let's see. So the goal is to find all A, B, C belong to natural numbers so that A raised to the power B plus 1 is equal to A plus 1 raised to the power C. Now, here's the thing. So whenever you see like a Diophantine equation or in general, maybe like a number theory problem involving equations, the system of equations, maybe it's good to kind of like discuss the trivial solutions, right? Trivial solutions. So what are the trivial solutions? Trivial solutions are basically solutions that can be easily found you know, without a lot of, without a lot of hard work. They can easily be formed observations, just a simple observation, very less work is required to do that. And really the way to find that is just maybe plug one of these variables as one, maybe plug in A is equal to one, maybe plug in B is equal to one, maybe plug in C is equal to one, and then kind of just observe how B and C, how the other variables depend on that. So the trivial solution, there are like two families of trivial solution that you can find. So for example, the first family would be when A is equal to C is equal to one and B is equal to B. So it does not matter what B is, A is equal to C is equal to one and B is equal to B actually satisfies the equation. So for example, one raised to the power B plus one is equal to one plus one raised to the power C and C is obviously one. So this is one and one raised to the power B is always one. So one plus one is equal to one plus one, which is true. So we can actually see that one comma b comma one is a solution for all b belong to natural numbers because we have natural numbers in the question. Okay, that's great. Well, what's the second family of solutions that I can find? Well, it so turns out that um, if b is equal to c is equal to one, and if a is equal to a, then that also holds because a raised by one plus one is equal to a plus one raised by one. Basically, a plus one, right? So therefore, a comma one comma one is also a solution for all A belonging to natural numbers. So these are kind of like the trivial solutions, right? We got two families of trivial solutions, an infinite number of solutions over there because of infinite natural numbers. Okay, but what about the non-trivial solutions? Non-trivial solutions are solutions that are maybe like a little bit hard to find, right? Or like not standard. Like here you can maybe just plug in one comma one and then see that this holds. So these are kind of trivial solutions, but what about a solution? Maybe something like um, something like let's say two comma three comma two. How do you know that this thing holds? Maybe seven comma eight comma twenty seven. Something like that. You know, I'm not I'm not saying that this does hold. I'm saying that if a solution exists, how do you know that? Right? Or how do you know that these are the only solutions? If they are the only solutions. Well, it so turns out the only non-trivial solutions are the one given by the Catlin's conjecture. So let's just discuss the Catlin's conjecture. So what is the Catlin's conjecture? So Catlin's conjecture was pretty much an unsolved problem for a really, really long time. And it says, it says, it says that the only kind of solutions in natural numbers to the equation x is to power m minus y is to power n is equal to one is three squared minus two cubed is equal to one. So essentially, the only x comma y comma m comma n that satisfies this equation over here is when x is three, m is two, when y is two, n is three. So essentially this is what I wrote, right? Three squared minus two cubed is equal to one. So these are the only like pairs, only like four solutions, x comma y comma m comma n that satisfy this given equation. That's essentially the, what the Catlin's conjecture says. 
and it so turns out the only non-trivial solutions for our original equation which was a is for b plus 1 is equal to a plus 1 this per c are the ones of the Catalan's conjecture. Now, how do you see that? Well, essentially, it's just a plus 1 raised per c minus a raised per b is equal to 1. So, you can kind of see that this is of this form, right? x raised per m minus y raised per n is equal to 1. By Catalan's conjecture, the only solution is 3 square minus 2 cubed is equal to 1. So, basically, a plus 1 needs to be 3. Therefore, a is equal to 2, c is equal to 3, and b is equal to how much? Like, uh, sorry, c is equal to 2. And b is equal to 3. So you can actually see that 2 plus 1, that is 3 squared minus a is 2 cube is equal to 1. This actually holds. Right? So 2, 3, 2 is a valid solution by Catalan's conjecture, and it will be the only non trivial solution by also Catalan's conjecture. Right? Because Catalan's conjecture effectively states that this, um, th this, this one case is the only uh, is, is the only solution to this equation. But but here's the here's the interesting part. This Catalan's conjecture was proved by a Romanian mathematician called Mihai Lescu in the year 2002. And this problem came in the France TST in the year 2000. So we're talking about like a couple of years before the formal proof, the rigorous proof for this Catalan's conjecture came out. So you really could not use them in Olympiads style exams where you have to denote a subjective answer. So what do you do? So what do you do? So so, so yeah, what do you do? You so you essentially this problem, the why this problem was made, because it essentially contains like a special case of Catalan's conjecture, and that case is like solvable. It's like a contest style problem, and it effectively can be solved by the Zygmunds theorem, right? Which is like we have obviously discussed about this a couple of times before. So before we go into Zygmunds theorem, I think it's good to discuss maybe a generalization of this um, of this Catalan's conjecture that we just discussed. So, generalization of Catlin's. Maybe let's just talk a couple of lines about that. So, the generalization of this Catlin's conjecture is called actually Pillai's conjecture. Right? Pillai's conjecture. And this was proposed by this person, I believe, like the year 1931 or something, roughly around there. And he basically st states that for fixed integers, A, B, C, a comma b comma c a x raised power m minus b y raised power n is equal to c has finitely many solutions so it does not have an infinite solution it has finitely many solutions x comma y comma m comma n for m comma n not equal to 2 comma 2 so leaving this 2 comma 2 it only has some finitely many solutions and so it's like a generalization of this Catalan's conjecture. This Catalan's conjecture is what? X is power m minus y is power n is equal to 1. So if you put a is equal to b is equal to c is equal to 1, you actually see that Pillai's conjecture is a generalization of Catalan's conjecture. Or in other words, Catalan's conjecture is a special case of Pillai's conjecture with a is equal to b is equal to c is equal to 1. And it so happens that this that this Pillai's conjecture is still an open problem. It, a rigorous complete proof does not exist. Some people do argue that it exists, but I'll leave that up to you. Uh, you can maybe explore more about this if you want. But coming back to the problem, what did we have in the problem? A is for B plus 1 is equal to A plus 1 is for C. And we need to find the non-trivial solutions. How do we do that? Well, Zygmunds theorem is a good is a good approach. You don't need to use this. You may use LTE. You may use a little bit of binomial theorem. You may use something like there's a really technique that also works. But I think Zygmunds theorem pretty much gives it up very easily. Right? So what does it state? So Zygmunds theorem states that if the GCD of x comma y is equal to 1 then for all n not equal to 3 uh, there is a prime p such that p divides x is per n plus y is per n but p does not divide x is per m plus y is per m for all m less than n Essentially, P does divide x is per n plus y is per n, but does not divide a smaller power x is per n plus y is per m. And Zygmunds theorem is essentially just the application of the lifting the exponent lemma, LTE lemma on cyclotomic polynomials. It obviously has the exception where n is equal to 3. That was the exception case that we had discussed in previous problems. 
But okay, how can we maybe apply Zygmunt's theorem to a given problem over here, which was a raised to b plus one is equal to a plus one raised to power c? So okay, well here's what we do. So suppose b not is not equal to three and p is a prime that divides a raised to b plus one raised to b. Because if you see the left hand side of the equation, it's nothing but a raised to b plus one raised to b. Because one raised to b is nothing but one. So I'm saying that p divides a raised to b plus one raised to b. The assumption is that b is not three, so we're not in the exception case. So therefore, p does not divide a raised to m plus one raised to m for all m less than b. So effectively, p does not divide a plus one. So where m is equal to one over here. And you might say that how did I conclude this? Well, the idea is that b has to be greater than or equal to two. Because b is equal to one has already been considered by us in our trivial case, right? If you look at the trivial case over here, we've already considered the fact that b is equal to one. So we've already noted down all solutions for b is equal to one. We do not need to worry about that. The minimum value of b that we're considering is two. So therefore, m is equal to one. Obviously, p does not divide a plus one. And p, if p does not divide a plus one, then p will obviously not divide a plus one raised to power c for all values of c or for any values of c. So what can we see? So we see from over here. That if I just label that as equation number one, that p actually divides a raised to power b plus one, and p does not divide a plus one raised to power c. And what was in our question? In our question, we had a raised to power b plus one is equal to a plus one raised to power c. So p divides this thing, but p does not divide this thing. Therefore, therefore, no solutions exist. So what does that mean? What does that mean? No solutions exist. Well, here was the assumption that b is not equal to three. So if no solution exists, but in Zygmunt's theorem, then that means that we are on an exception case. So therefore, b is equal to three. And if I plug that in a problem, I'll get a cube plus one is equal to a plus one raised to the power c. Now here's what we'll do next. So we actually note that a cube plus one is actually less than a plus one whole cube. It's actually very simple because a plus one whole cube is equal to a cube plus b cube plus three a b times a plus b. So obviously, a cube plus a plus one whole cube is greater than a cube plus one. It's a pretty standard observation. But okay, so from this equation over here, if I can just replace the value of a cube plus one with a plus one this part c because they're equal, the a plus one this part c is less than a plus one whole cube. So therefore, c is less than three, and since c is a natural number, c is equal to one or two. Now again, c is equal to one. We've actually discussed that before. C is equal to one. We already discussed that before. This holds for uh, the case where C is equal to one. So C is equal to one. We already discussed that before. So we we'll only check for C is equal to two. Now at C is equal to two, what what did we have? We had a cube plus one is equal to a plus one whole squared. Just plug in the values, and then just simplify this. A squared plus two a plus one. This gets cancelled with this. So a cube minus a square negative two a is equal to zero. So that leaves us with a a square negative a negative two is equal to zero. That leaves me with a a minus two times a plus one is equal to zero. And since a is a natural number, the only solution over here is a is equal to two. So a is equal to two, c is equal to two, and obviously b is equal to three. So like I was saying, like I was saying, two comma three comma two is the only non-trivial solution. And which was something that we had seen from Catlin's conjecture as well. So the total solutions are the entire set of solutions are one comma b comma one. Then we have a comma one comma one. Then we have two comma three comma two. And these holds for all a comma b belong to natural numbers. So yeah, that's a pretty cool thing, right? So we actually see that you kind of getting the answer by Catlin's conjecture. It was good to know Catlin's conjecture twenty two years back. But obviously, it had not been proved, so you had to use something like Zygmunt's theorem or LTE or some of the other technique. So yeah, I uh, hope you learned something from that, and let's move forward. So there's some book suggestions for APMO and uh, senior math olympiad. This is mostly relating to algebra and a little bit of number theory. We have AMO compendium, we have polynomial by Barbeau, and elementary number theory by Sierpinski. Okay, so at the end of a similar but challenging problem, and I wanted to prove that x is for n. Plus y raised to n is equal to p raised to n has no solutions for n greater than or equal to three, such that x comma y are positive integers and p is a prime. So maybe try and use Zygmunt's theorem over here. This is actually similar to a problem that we had seen before in the European Mathematical Cup. 
So yeah, if you're able to make any progress on that or if you're able to solve that, let me in the comment section below. And until then, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Sinta programs are designed for students who are passionate about mathematics. And they are personalized with one-on-one -on -one training, individual evaluation, and remedial sessions. The reason Chinta students are successful over the last 10 years because they are taught by mathematicians and real Olympiads from leading universities in India, United States and Europe. Some of our students come back to teach at Chinta from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, MIT, UCLA, ISI, CMI, IITs, TIFR and IISC. For more information, visit chinta.com.